I am Bill Cortright with Living Right with Bill Cortright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am your host, Bill Cortright, and I'm here with the super millennial, David Barreto, giving us the millennial perspective. How you doing, Mr. Perspective? I'm doing good. How's it going? All right. So this week, our topic has been disruption in today's Connection Thursday. We're going to discuss leading through disruption in a third wave. That'll be fun, right? Interesting. So disruption is change. Disruption is an interruption with the routine. Now, what we would call normal becomes disrupted in a way in a which a way we do something, act in a certain way, and believe in something. So this is what disruption comes from. Now, humanity is in the midst of a disruption of how the human being will live their lives. So one of the things I'm going to touch on, David, and I'm going to do it again also next week. Next week is about finding your path. On Setup Sunday, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into this third wave um, as we transition. Humanity is transitioning in becoming an information society, but I don't believe people understand really what this transition is. And if you understand a transition, you'll understand the disruption. So 10,000 years ago, humanity went through a disruption. They had lived a certain way for 200,000 years. The first wave transition, moving from hunter and gatherer, existing in these bands of separate tribes, to transitioning into becoming farmers, moving into communities, set a new routine to live their lives. So, of course, there would be disruption. Now, this routine was thousands of years. This routine, this new routine would be for thousands of years until another disruption took place. And this disruption hit in the 1830s as humanity entered the second wave transition, humanity moving from this agricultural age to the industrial age and becoming a manufacturing society. And this is very important for us today. This disruption of routine was harsh in the beginning. Think about it. It transformed economies, moving from the agriculture and making handicrafts to large-scale industrial that was mass-producing goods. This disruption brought rapid changes to humanity, urbanization, the movement of people to cities. Almost overnight, these small towns that would be around coal or where they could get iron mi- or iron mines, these they mushroomed into these huge cities because this is what was needed to provide factories to be built. So in the late, what people don't realize is in the late 1950s, you understand the industrial wave, right? Yeah. Yeah. In the late 1950s, humanity began its third wave transition from industrial age, manufacturing society to becoming an information society. Does that shock you? Yeah, there's a little bit. Yes, because (laughs) this is really important because I think this is where a lot of people are not understanding. It's not just technology, people. So this, it seems like this shift to the third wave is recent, but it actually began 60 years ago. I was born into a world. There's where no speed delivery, right? No overnight delivery, only mail. There was no internet, only libraries. There were no video games, only board games. There were no mobile phones, that, let alone smartphones. There was landlines. There was no 24-hour news, sports, you know, 24-hour sports or entertainment. You had 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock news. And television stations would actually sign off at the end of the day. I know you don't remember that. They would actually shut down. You'd hear the national anthem, and boom, you'd have a, a blank screen. So the third wave transition. What it did was it, the routines of the manufacturing age, and this transition began in the 1950s, and it began with a movement. It began with civil rights. Now, think about the 1960s. 
you have the civil rights movement, right? You have women's rights movement. You have space travel. You have sexual revolution. You have anti-war. You have new government coming in. All that happened in the 1960s. And so people don't understand, disruption is a change of routine. Routine is set through belief systems. Belief systems and programs that set reality and behavior. While the third wave information society is heavily attached to technology, it's so much bigger. The beliefs and routines that created the social and cultural programming of prejudice, racism, gender inequality is being exposed. The caste system set in the second wave will not survive the third wave. The moral programming set in the second wave What is a marriage? Who is worthy of God? How should you worship? Who should be heard? Who should not be heard? Will not survive the third wave. You have to understand, this second wave was built in standardization. One size fits all. So what was that programming from the industrial age? It it told you how you how you should worship. How uh, school, how you should learn. Everybody learn the same way. Factories, how you should work. It told you how you should shop, how you should rule, how you should govern, how you should lead. All of that. The, indu- the institutional programming set in the second wave of who can be president, who can be leaders, who should just do what they are told will not survive in the third wave. The political leadership programming set in the second wave, who are qualified to lead. The looking at people, looking at people as objects that must be led because they aren't smart enough to lead themselves. This will not survive in the third wave. So you see the big disruption that is and is still taking place. The third wave is blowing up the second wave belief systems and programming. And this was all done in standardization. It was built where one size fits all approach, typical of institution institutions stemming from that second wave era. And leaders from this era will fail in the third wave. The one size fits all institutions such as our educational systems and schools, factories, governments, houses of worship, high volume mass production and distribution will fail in the third wave information society. And the reason is this. It's actually quite simple. The biggest disruption to the second wave is connection. The information age is the age of connection. Connection in the third wave information age exposes everything. In the 1970s, it exposed government through Watergate. It it abu- it showed abuse, exposed abuse in church and religion. It showed abuse of entire societies, abuses of entire races and, and genders being, being put down, abuse of controlling leaders who see people as objects to be used. You see, connection is aimed to expand togetherness into creating interrelations. This is relationship with the creation mind heart. So, Everything is changing, and technology is just part of it. I will go into it more on Sunday because I'm going to break down each each of the 60s or 70s and how you can see how the wave was building up to today. But when people hear information society, what do they think? Technology. Nope. Are you understanding this? Yeah, I, I think it's the, the the part for me that you said is the one size fits all thing because I think that's where you see a lot of uprising and problems happening now because it seems like every day you, you literally can put on something and find some sort of disruption within like our culture or society that wouldn't have been, you would have been considered like the oddball out, like trying to you know, you're a hippie or you're a, a protester or, you're, or this. And now it's like one person says it. And then it's like, well, if it doesn't fit for that person, then we need to change the entire system on how it works. And I think that's one because like the, the people have so much more of a voice. Like you said, you watched two different news outlets and that was about it. Now a person with a phone can literally shape government, 
society, economies. I mean, just the, this as simple as like a Elon Musk taking over Twitter. Why was that such a big deal? A billionaire bought a company. It was allowing more people to create more disruption in all reality because it was allowing more free speech and what was going to be left. So it's those little things that we kind of don't pay attention to that lead to the big things that make a change for us. And this wave is huge. It's not, the information society is not just technology. It's part of it. It's yeah. a connection. In connection, you see everything. Everything's exposed. You said it. The moment you see something, you can have something happen in China. China tries to stop that, right? It doesn't. It still doesn't stop it. You can't stop this wave. You can't stop. Our, our poor listener in North Korea, you can't stop him from listening to Stress Mastery. He's going to yeah. listen to Stress Mastery, right? You can't stop this. See, this relationship is with the creation mind heart. This is the, this is the wave. It's not acceptable to judge a person. It's not judge their skin color, their gender, their sexual preference. The second wave leaders are fighting to stay relevant. In the current wave and the state of humanity shift, they are fighting to stay relative. But as my generation ages, this will continue to weaken. And this is a solid truth for those leaders fighting to survive. You cannot stop this wave. You can embrace it. You can ride it or you can be crushed by it, but it cannot be stopped. Just like the hunter and gatherer could not stop the shift to the agriculture age. And just like the farmer couldn't stop the shift to the industrial age, no one will stop the shift to the information age. And until this shift becomes completed, humanity will be in massive disruption. It's just the process of the old guard and the new guard coming in. My generation leaving, your generation coming in. That's exactly what is happening. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with this. See, to lead, we're talking about leaders today. And to lead through this disruption, the leader will have to shift and completely transform their belief systems and routines of leading. You can't lead people today the way you led them 30 years ago. Yeah. Sorry. You know, I can read Lee Iacocca's book and how he turned around Chrysler, how he did this. It's irrelevant today. It wouldn't work today. Mm -hmm. Sorry. You can argue with me all you want. It wouldn't work. You see, that's what we're seeing. And leadership is must embrace this and understand it. Your thoughts on that, David? Yeah, I think that's where it has to become more of a kind of a fluid thing. Uh, cause that's where you kind of lose employees and things like that. Cause we've even talked about if you treated me the same way that like, you know, the same way Alex, your daughter worked, we are completely different people Push me that way. I doubt we would still be working together. And that's because we need to be led differently. It doesn't mean that it needs to be easier. It doesn't need to, you know, baby somebody. It's just, you need to understand that. I think it's understanding that we're not groups, we're individuals. And then being able to identify that has to become a skill rather than a, a scaring tactic. If you don't fit in, well, go. Well, now millennials are like, fine, I will leave. Watch yes. this. And, and that I, is no longer And I threat. love it because what you're saying is this episode. I'm going to bring that to, to, I'll bring it to, I'll close it in. I'll tighten it up for you. Okay. So to lead through disruption, a leader will have to shift completely themselves, right? Leading through disruption begins with the leader. First, the leader must understand themselves. Second, they must understand others. And third, they must be executing in a new flexible process so it can evolve as humanity continues to evolve. So I actually believe stress mastery is and will be a big part of the third wave transition of humanity. So number one begins with the core essence of stress mastery. Leaders must understand the function and operation of the human being. While humanity is going through this huge shift, the human being remains the same. The human being remains the same as they did 200,000 years ago in how the mind is set and operates, how the body supports the mind, and how the brain's hierarchy is set for survival to go negative before it goes positive. The human being hasn't changed. If we can understand this, we can create a calculated blueprint to transform our subjective reality 
your inner world to work within the framework of this third wave transition. Do you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. So number two, as the third wave transition is moving away from that one size fits all, David, standardization model of of existence, it is important that we begin to see and know each person for who they are. Exactly what you said. Not what they were programmed to be or should be, but who they are. If leaders empower people to discover their purpose and their true self values, your self value is who you are, they will embrace people as they are versus how they want them to be. And if those who follow you are put into position of connection to their creation mind and purpose, they will thrive and so will the leaders leading them. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on that aspect? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's putting people for the right tool for the right job. You know, I think that's where you, you fail. You can't expect to to have somebody who has no interest or no want to do something at their best ability unless you make it work for them. And I think that's where like a leader will kind of thrive is identifying that is like is going way back to how we were in the beginning. The tribe worked know. because they knew their job, they did their job, and they were great at it. You didn't put a hunter to gather, you know. Right. Pick, you know, nowadays we just do it because we're all paid the same dollar rate, so you expect it to be expendable, and it's just not how people are. It may have to be how businesses were, but it's not how it is. It's You're seeing the transition. Ask McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. They better be paying 20 bucks to flip a burger pretty soon because nobody's going to do it. <laughs> You know, so I'm telling yeah. you, this is the shift. And I'm not making this up. All you have to do is slow down and look. So number three, to lead in this third wave transition, these leaders must view people as their greatest asset. This is very important. Companies now must look at the individual as their greatest asset. In today's world, this is pretty much wordplay. People say they do it. Companies say they do it. But I'm working with these top CEOs. I'm working with these top executives. I'm working with these. And I know it's just wordplay. Mm -hmm. They want to do it, but they're not doing it. It's one thing to create a meme about your employees are your greatest asset. It's another to put this into practice. If your people are your greatest asset, then you must invest in them. You must invest in the individual. They're your asset. The human being is hardwired for behavior. The behavior is dictated by the programming of the identity held in mind. This was set as a child. It will be a rare individual in the third wave transition information society that this individual has a set identity that will fit into the fast paced changing world. Even your generation right? The older millennials. Think about how much it's changed for you guys even, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to invest. If leaders of companies, of organizations can come to understand this simple truth, that your people are your greatest asset, then they will realize that they must invest in the people that they lead through personal development. Teaching the individual truth, facts, how the human being works, and then invest in them in rewriting and self-authoring their identity that fits in today's world. And let me tell you, it's not just about the company. You've got to invest in the employee and their life, their relationships, their health, because all of that will come back. Until this happens, old guard leaders, old ways of teaching Companies and organizations will struggle with the millennial and Gen Z employees. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, David, I'll just leave. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on that? Because I know that's a big statement for leaders out there. Yeah, there's a there's a business YouTube that I watched that he said that you want to create em employees that everybody wants, but treat them well enough that they don't want to go anywhere. And I think that's like the the, the prime example. He talks about how, you can tell if you have a crappy employee, if they call out and they don't care, you know, about what happens. But then when you invest into somebody that they love their job, they do all this, 
when they have to call out, and I mean really have to, they feel bad because they don't want to screw over their their coworkers, the the company itself. They they feel bad because it's something important to them, and it's not just a paycheck. And I think that's a, a a critical part for like people right now who are listening to say, well, if you had to call out tomorrow, what's your feelings about it? Do you care? Do you not care? Do you feel bad for the person next to you who has to pick up the slack? Like that is a big indicator on whether or not the company is investing in you and how much you want to give back to the company because that that energy exchange. It's huge, David. So number four, I'll put this one up. Leaders must understand how the human perceives reality. you got to understand how your people function. Each person has their own inner world, their subjective reality. The challenge is this is rarely in alignment with the outer world and the objective reality, right? This is what causes conflict, stress, and reaction and problems. The leader in the third wave must first understand this truth and second, lead their people to master conflict resolution. That means getting out of the problem, getting into reflection and dealing with it. The leader must be able to guide their people into the objective reality of what is. And the leader themselves must be able to do this. They must stop feeding a conflict. This is what creates a problem. And this is what creates conflict distortion. And this is what creates the conflict virus. This is when you have big problems in your company. Mm -hmm. And you got to help others to move into this reflection so they can get out of the conflict and find solutions. This means stop thinking about the damn problem and move into the solution. For a leader to do this, They must take complete ownership of everything and help or empower their people. They have to help their people move out of the cage mind and a problem into that heart creation mind resolution where they can respond. This cannot be accomplished in force. You can't force it in the red zone energies. It can't be done in blame, fear, like you said, Dave, anger, It is only done through reflection in awareness, which is what activates the intelligence of courage. Now, I think this is huge for people to understand because the wave's not going to stop, Dave. Mm -hmm. So either leaders buck up, start to look at it and realize, hey, what I'm doing isn't working. (laughs) Might want to try a different approach. And they're the ones that got to bring down the deaf effect. They're the ones that got to get out of perceptual blindness. They're the ones that got to be ready to listen and willing to learn and able to do. Because if the leader can't do that, how can anybody help the people? And what happens? The people leave. Your yeah. thoughts, Dave? Yeah, I think it's a like it, leadership becomes kind of like an interesting role because there's, I guess, technically like a, a hierarchy within the business. But then you have to remember that you're still the same thing as them, a person, you know? So I think being able to resonate with somebody on that level where you can separate the business and see when like a, you know, a parent that works for you is struggling or, yes. you know, they're, they're showing up late and it's habitual. It's like this person never did this before. Like it's, it's seeing more than just, well, your productivity is down this month. It's going back. It's like, well, this person showed up late a few times. This normally doesn't happen. Or this is my star person. And now they're not. You know, people look at numbers and not people. I think that becomes the issue because then once they find like a company that's, you know, you need to start 15 minutes later because you're running late because of the school change or whatever the case is. And it's showing that you're working for the, like the the leader needs to work for the person, for the person to work for the company. And I think that's an aspect that people don't usually look at. They have to be in awareness. Not mm-hmm. reaction, right? Yeah. So like you said, it, it, I'm telling you, if you keep looking at people as objects, numbers, percentages, you are not seeing them. So they might have problems in a relationship. They might have a health problem. There might be somebody sick in their family. There might be a situation. If you don't know that as a leader and you think that that's not important, well, guess what? Your greatest asset is going to break down. Mm-hmm. You see, that's where it's different. And I'm telling you, people can say, well, Bill, you're, this is not how leadership works. You got to be strong. You got to do this. 
yeah, you have to be strong. The leader has to be strong enough to put down their ego and see the person and have some compassion and try to help them in their situation. Help them resolve their situation. You don't have to fix them, but if you don't see them and you just keep pushing them, well, you're going to lose them. Yeah, you're this, not going to lead them. This actually reminds me of the same thing because, like, we talk about it right now. We're talking about business, but it's the same thing that translates into like teaching or any type of leadership that comes well without you know a paycheck. Because the teachers that pulled me to the side and said, "What's up." Those are the ones I opened up to. And I, I put an effort into making a better choice or more effort into getting a better grade because they cared. And I think it's as weird as it sounds. It's like that word care is like the the breaking point between do you actually worry about the individual or are they just an object? And like I said, it translates to, to parents, to school, to churches, you know, the leadership within church, anywhere you look, that caring aspect is the important part of it and chelsea's proven it so yeah. chelsea in her classroom has proven it with with students that have been held back and she leads differently she's leading in this third wave leader and the scores reflect exactly what she's done and everybody wants to know how she did it well she cared and that creates leaders she, yeah she's creating leaders just by yes. being a leader exactly so number five, I have leaders must teach, and I think this is really important, proper goal setting process. It really is. This, is. this begins with a clear vision and mission for your company, your organization, and the individual. You can't tell the individual their, their, their mission. Mm-hmm. They got to become part of the mission, but they have to have their own mission. Now, first thing is you got to set the light. What is the mission of the company? Can the person be able to buy into the mission? Once you do that, you can get people to set. Then it's time to set a plan. And you set a plan. Each, each leader has to set a plan for their people. And once the plan is set, it's time to execute that plan. And then all the thinking must stop. The plan must be viewed in reflection. The leader must be owning it. This is not thinking in the head, which locks people into their own subjective reality. No, it's moving. Reflection is done in objective reality of what is. This is looking at the plan as it's being executed. And this is being in that green zone in the 200 curves where they're alert, 250 neutrality where you can explore and moving into that 310 willingness where you can listen and be willing to learn, move it in that 350 where you're able to do, you're accepted. This is moving the plan up the mountain instead of trying to force the plan in the red zone through fear, through frustration, through anger, through through trying to power things through. So leaders, viewing conflicts as problems creates a conflict virus. This is when your people start to come together to complain about the same thing. Why does that happen? Because they want to make sure that their reality is justified. And this creates that conflict distortion. Now this little thing is big. And all of this is due to the leader not getting them out of that red zone state of restriction and base energy fear. Not listening to them, not engaging with them not knowing them, all these things. The third wave transition for humanity is based on a single factor, David, connection. That's what it's based on. Every one of us is connected. Everything is connected. That's why we see everything. This is about expanding togetherness. This is about motivation to create. It's about interrelations. This is living life through the true self in reflection and expansion state, base energy, courage. This is where the third wave leadership must move into if you want to lead the next, I don't know how many years it's going to be, 100 years? I don't know. Is this the last wave for humanity? I don't know. But I know this wave is powerful and technology is ramping it up. The pandemic ramped it up. AI is ramping it up. You can fight it all you want. 
and all these leaders that are talking about the good old days and this and stuff, they are ignorant because you're not going to stop this wave. They're the same leaders that were telling the gathered hunters, forget about living in communities. Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to get over here? Let's go walk the land for some more and search for food and be hungry and be out here with the damn tigers. Hey, idiots. That's all I got to say. You got some, David. I'm sorry. It's just ignorance means you don't know. Yeah. And true ignorance is you don't want to know. You want to, you think your way is right. But if everybody is changing, if everybody's looking at things differently, if the whole millennial population doesn't work like the baby boomers work, come on, man. There's got to be something going on, right? <laughs> I'm just saying. Your thoughts, David? Uh, the, the one thing that you said about the leader being able to teach and set higher goal setting, I think that's a one thing that I wish um, like a company like Best Buy would have done uh, with me because to me it was a job. It, it, it paid the bills. It did what I needed to do, and I had no interest in, in moving up that ladder. You know, for me, it was a means to an end for what they've invested so much time and try to push me to, to, to move up and things like that. And the people that I knew that had, you know, aspirations to move up, they fell by the wayside. And I think that's important too, is that some people, they are this, there for a job, you know, there are going to be those people, but being able to identify those who really want to grow and, you know, go further and stuff like that. Those are the people that you invest in a business kind of sense side, you know, kind of it come sure. here this is how i do these things or you know little ticks trips and things that got you to where you were and the other ones you invest and you care for you know they're, they're still a person they're still there and that's where i think the opportunities hey you know you can pass it to a certain individual you can pass it to this person instead if they would pass hey do you want to be a supervisor david i'm like yeah sure i'll take it just because it pays more, I have no aspirations of being a leader. I have no aspirations of building this company or the team. And now everybody else suffers for it. You know, it's to me, that's not caring either. It's being exactly. to care for who, who really cares for the company and who's there for, you know, to pay a bill, which yeah. is a re reality of where we are. And even I'll take you back there. You were working. You hated it. But then what happened when you kind of discovered who you were and you started working on yourself? You didn't hate it anymore. You didn't, it's not, it wasn't your career and you knew it, but you went to work and you weren't hating it anymore. That's yeah, it, the well, power of knowing who you are. Yeah. And, and that, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. Like you, I would have hated it even more if I didn't like the people I, I worked for and worked with. So the leadership there actually made me not hate the job for the people it's my mindset that said, you know what, we make the best out of anything. But the fact that they cared when I showed up late, they're like, you good? You need some time? Like, it was never a, eh, this little problem child, he's just waiting to get the hell out of here. That's the difference between, like, leadership that, you know, cares for people and then cares for numbers. Because, no, I was by far not the best employee at that time because I kind of didn't want to be. You know, I didn't want the extra responsibilities and things like that. When there was somebody next to me who's willing to work five times as hard to prove themselves for the next promotion, the next, you know, and that sounds kind of messed up, but they would give me opportunities because I had a certain amount of experience. Like experience is one thing, but effort is a whole nother thing that if a leader can identify that, then that's a hard and their desire. Right, their yeah. goals, what they want. Because yeah, exactly. they, know, they, they didn't teach the, the yeah, they never asked there me much. for if they no, would have asked me, what's your purpose at this job? It's so I can pay my bills. But if you would ask that person, oh, well, right. eventually I want to run my own store and, you know, eventually yeah. go to corporate. It's like, wow. Let me they know. lost the opportunity with yes. that, right? Exactly. And that's yes. exactly right. So I, I'm just putting this out there, and I know this is going to be a little controversial because I can already hear it. But <laughs> if we look at it, you must understand that the third wave transition, to becoming an information society is not technology. Technology is part of it. It is connection. Mm -hmm. It began in the 60s, civil rights, women's rights. It started there. That's where the anti-war protests started. Everything started. What was it? People started to connect. And when you start to connect, you start to see. That's when truth is revealed. 
You can't hide in today's world. And that's good. This is a good thing because people got to be honest. Because I will tell you, if we weren't in the third wave, Watergate never happens. If Mm -hmm. that same thing happened, Watergate in the 1950s, it's covered up. You never hear about it. Never hear about it. Never hear anything about it. But since it wasn't, (laughs) things were changing. And that's when reporting was changing. And things were becoming connected, exposed. There you go. That's what you have. This is when it started. And I'll get deeper into it on Sunday. All right, Dave. That's all I got. That was good. Good good Different. That's it it for today's show. Our mission here is to create a shift in the planet. You can join us on this mission. Simply like, share, and subscribe. Those links are right below the show notes. As always, it's David at livingrightwithnocoatright.com. Until next time, stay inspired.